You know, you never know what God's up to. You never know. And uh, let's just not give up. God can do great things. Amen? God can do amazing things. There's perhaps some things you've been holding on to and waiting on, and maybe you're doubting. But the Lord's able to see you through, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about because he lives, he appears in our doubts. Because he lives, he appears in our doubts. Over the last few weeks, we started a series. Uh, We started on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, and it really was an intro to what we're going to be unpacking for a few months. Because he lives. We're taking John 20 and we're journeying through it. The first message had to do with because he lives, he appears in our grief. Last week, Pastor Jared so eloquently and beautifully spoke on the topic, because he lives, he appears in our fears. And today we want to talk about how because he lives, the third section of this great passage in chapter 20, because he lives, he appears in our our doubts. Let's look at verse 24. I'm going to have you read the last couple of verses with me, most likely, but let's look at verse 24. Now, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Don't you like that phrase? We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came, with the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Read this verse 28 and 29 with me aloud together. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's quite a statement. Father, make it easy to preach today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's obvious that Jesus is making these appearances. His disciples have no doubt lost faith. They're struggling He showed up, first of all, to Mary, the first woman preacher. We talked about that. Um, There were some of you that sat very still, and the rest of you said amen a few Sundays ago, and we talked about that. She proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and ran into the city proclaiming and ran to the disciples proclaiming that he is risen. We then see him as he begins to move to his disciples makes himself known to several of them, and they have witnessed him alive, and so they're convinced. But there's this man that we often call Doubting Thomas. He's having what we would call a faith crisis. You ever had a faith crisis? I know it may be difficult to admit, but I know there are people in this room that have had a faith crisis. I remember as a young man, perhaps 16, 17 years of age, I really had a faith crisis. I was full of questions, and I'm thankful for the fact that I had parents whom I could talk to about that without being judged or ridiculed or put down. I was allowed to ask questions. I was allowed to process. And they were very open and honest, and when they couldn't answer, they just said, perhaps you need to talk with somebody else, but here's what we know. And a faith crisis is difficult. Some people will have faith crisis later in life. A big disappointment can come, perhaps a loss, a series of events. Things can go away. Things begin to get difficult, and suddenly they find themselves questioning, is God real? 
Does he really care about me? Is he really there? Is that which I have been taught really true? And we can go through these faith crises, and that's exactly where Thomas finds himself. He's doubting is what he's doing. He's often referred to as doubting Thomas. But let's look at this whole definition. To doubt means to be uncertain about, uncertain about something, to believe that something may not be true or is unlikely, to have no confidence in someone or something. When you begin to look at this verb, you, you find words that uh, tend to kind of further unpack it and, and cause one to be suspect or pessimistic or skeptical, and the list of words go on and on and on. And this is exactly where Thomas is at. He's questioning. Perhaps he has an analytical personality. We don't know, but there's some of you that have analytical personalities and you want to know the facts. You want to have those facts lined up. You want, it, you want to know everything before you can believe something. It has to be logical. It has to be right. We, we don't know. It would probably be unfair for us to just automatically assume that, but it could be that he's rather analytical or embarrassed about what he had got caught up into. What, what about that? That hit me this week as I was flying back and I was kind of looking at this passage. I don't know about you, but, but I have to admit, perhaps I'd be rather embarrassed. I mean, after all, I put myself out there on the line and I was a follower of Christ and people knew that and family may know that and friends may know that. And, 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 and I've got this perception in mind that, that Jesus is really going to turn some things around and he's my great hope. And, and then to observe him going through this brutal, murder, murderous uh, kind of death and, and to watch him be humiliated as he was, that had to be earth-shaking for this guy. I think some of us are pretty quick to judge him when we perhaps ourselves would would find ourselves in a faith crisis. We don't know if he was analytical. We don't know if he was just embarrassed because he had been perhaps felt like he was duped into following this so-called leader and suddenly he's dead and this disappointment is so overwhelming that he cannot find an inkling of faith inside of himself to believe that what Jesus told him was true. We don't know. I think it's healthy to try to put his sandals on. I do know that. Before we get rough with people who are going through faith crisis, perhaps we need to try to put their sandals on. Am I making any sense this morning? Perhaps we need to step back and look, what are they going through? Perhaps we might find ourselves having some of the same questions if we were to go through such things. I think that there are varying degrees of doubt. I like the way, and I think it's important to note this up front as we look at this little passage, I like the way that Thomas kind of leaves himself a way out. Some people won't leave themselves a way out. An atheist that proclaims to be an atheist won't leave themselves a way out. They just say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that he exists. I don't believe that Jesus got up from the grave. I just don't believe it. I don't believe it for a minute. And they don't leave themselves a way out. At least I can appreciate Thomas kind of leaving himself a way out. He, he didn't say absolutely not. He said, for me to believe, I've got to, I've got to touch him. I've got to see him. I've got to put my finger in his, in his scars. I've got, to, I've got to reach out and know that he exists and that he's real. You, you know, I, I guess I can kind of understand that. He, he does leave himself a way out. Maybe there's varying degrees of all of this doubt business. I think there are. Jesus can appear in the middle of all of that, that's what's amazing. When we have such a lack of faith, sometimes we're duped into thinking that we have to have this great measure of faith for, for God to do anything for us. But one thing I get out of this, this story this morning and one thing I get out of this passage of Scripture is that Jesus can step into my, 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 my biggest day of weakness, my, my, the day that I may doubt the most. Jesus has the ability to step right into the middle of that and say, hey, I'm here. When I may be carrying the most guilt because I'm in faith crisis, when I, when I may be wondering if I really got it all together, somehow Jesus steps into the middle of that. And through his grace and mercy, he can show up when we have our biggest faith crisis. Can you give the Lord praise for that? That is good. And thank God for that. I don't know. Perhaps you're struggling this morning. Perhaps you're struggling in your ministry. Perhaps you didn't see this thing coming. Perhaps it was rather unexpected. 
My heart, I, I can't help it. It's, it's been said already today. I, I keep going back to Randy and Mava Nil, Nil, uh, Wilson and uh, Miss Mava, who's so special to us. Is the Frasers, they're here today. Their daughter, we all know Mava. Randy going through this crisis, brain cancer. This fierce, unrelenting disease has come back again. They're dealing with all of that, and then yesterday his father drops dead. What do you do with all of that? You know, that's life sometimes, isn't it? That's life sometimes. Sometimes life can be hell. Sometimes life can be nothing but a big struggle. And we fail at times in the middle of that. We find ourselves asking questions like, God, where were you? Is everything I've been taught, is it true? When I look at your word, is it really true? I've been taught this, I've memorized that, I've been church all my life, but is it true? I guess I can relate, you know, if you've been through some bumps and bruises in life and you've had some losses and you've really went through some trying times, I think we can understand where Thomas is at. But once again, I want to remind you, thank God Jesus can step in in the middle of all of that and show himself to be mighty. Oh, come on, let's all give him praise. He's worthy of that praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first thing we see about Thomas's crisis is that he has an uncanny need for isolation. Thomas was absent when Jesus appeared and consequently missed a blessing. He wasn't with the other guys when Jesus showed up the first time. I mean, they're giddy about this. They're excited. We've seen Jesus. They had to get to Thomas and tell him, where was he? He was nowhere, <laughs> he was nowhere around. He was kept in suspense and unbelief for eight days while all around him there was rejoicing in the fact that Jesus had risen. But he didn't see it. He didn't he hadn't experience that. He didn't know what to believe here. Have you ever watched people pull back when they have a faith crisis? You ever watched them just kind of pull back when they, they hit that faith crisis? We, we would do well to remember when we are in a faith crisis, we, we perhaps do the same thing. I don't mean, I'm not meddling, I'm really not, but I've watched this through the years. I've been pastoring long enough to see this pattern. I've watched people through the years, and as I was looking at this this week, I mean, names came to mind. I've watched people go from the front few rows to nothing wrong with sitting in the back. You're, you're real church of God if you're in the back. But I've watched people be so excited about Jesus, so fresh in the relationship with him, and they're up here in the, toward the front or the front half, and then they get going through a, a faith crisis and they start slipping back. And I'm not saying that's the case all the time, but I've seen that. And as a pastor, because of seeing that kind of thing, so it's not wrong to slip back in a sanctuary, but if you're slipping back because you're in a faith crisis, I'm concerned. And then to ultimately slip out the door. And you find yourself asking, where are they? This person that had this Radical conversion, this person that confessed Christ, this person that, that really was doing well, suddenly they're not in the family anymore. They're gone. You know, faith crisis can cause you to desire isolation. It can cause you to desire to be alone. And, 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 I, and when I went through some deaths in my family and I had a little moment of crisis or hours or days or however long it lasted, I have to tell you it's in my nature to just kind of want to be alone and process it. You know, sooner or later, that has to come to an end. Am I okay? It has to come to an end. A faith crisis will throw you, if you're not careful, into complete isolation. And Thomas, for eight days, has been out there wandering around by himself, trying to process all of that. You know, just think, during that eight days, Thomas missed out on some real blessing. He could have had more hangout time with Jesus. <laughs> he really missed out. And the same thing can happen in your life. Through faith crisis, that prayer meeting that you used to attend faithfully, it could be that at one of those prayer meetings something really happened that would have encouraged your soul and, and taken faith deeper in your heart and turned some things around. A, a prayer may have been missed that may have transformed your situation. You can't pull back. Hang in there by faith. Isolation. There could have been a song that was being sang one Sunday morning and when you're home with that empty vacuum processing Perhaps it was the right song that would have, that sang under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that would have broken those chains and somehow put faith in your soul that could have turned things around. 
Perhaps there was a prayer that could have went up. Perhaps there was a message. Well, I don't know. I, I'm just processing with you. I'm just saying that isolation too long when you're going through a faith crisis may not be good. It may not be good. Can we give the Lord praise for the family of God? We need one another. We really do need one another in faith crisis. Not only is there this uncanny need for isolation, there's this unexpected attitude. Thomas is completely convinced that the dream he had eight to ten, ten days earlier is dead. I mean, think about the hopes. The whole, I mean, the people that were following Jesus, the multitudes, the throngs of people were so filled with hope that Jesus was going to turn things around in the nation. That the great prophecies in the Old Testament were about to be true. That there was going to be some amazing things that happened. And yet, hope turned to hopelessness. Anticipation has turned to surreal reality. And Jesus is dead. He's not coming back. Have you ever had that type of unexpected attitude? This thing that I perceived would happen is dead. This dream that I had is dormant. My hope is turned to hopelessness. And perhaps, perhaps such are some of you. You are filled with so much hope. And perhaps a crisis has changed everything. Perhaps the loss of a spouse. Perhaps that thing that God had put in your heart for that son or daughter. It's just never really worked out. I don't know. I don't know what your business is. I don't know what your dreams are. I don't know what all of your hopes have been. I just know that Jesus can step in the middle of all of that unexpected attitude. I just know that you don't have to measure up with all the name it, claim it stuff. And I know that you don't, have to, you don't have to measure up with being able to quote so many scriptures. And I know that you don't have to do this and do that. I know that Jesus, because of his grace, can step right into the middle of your lack of faith and your despondency and your pain and the middle of doctor's reports and everything else that you get. Jesus can appear in the middle of that because he lives today. It's true. It's true. Is that unexpected attitude. And then there's thirdly this, Thomas has this unwavering need for evidence. I can kind of understand that. Can you? If God could just show up and show me, you ever felt that way? And everybody else on the outside can tell you how you're supposed to do it. You can get blamed for pulling the trigger too early you can get blamed for pulling the trigger too late. Welcome to leadership. Hello. I mean, it just goes with it. And, and, and everybody can have their own perspective. Humanity can have all their perspective. But I'm just so glad that the Lord has a way of showing up when you don't know what to do. And you're feeling like you need evidence. Evidence. Lord, people have given me words before, but is this really of you? Lord, I've opened my Bible up and it's fell to this scripture, and does that mean it's of you or is it get lucky day? I mean, I go to a Chinese restaurant and open up the cookie and look what it says. Oh, come on, I'm being a little fun there. <laughs> We're searching for <laughs> evidence. Searching for something to hold on to. Thomas is there. If God could just show up, I'm not believing this unless I can put my finger where those nails went in. And I'm not believing this unless I can touch those nail-scarred hands. I'm not believing this. You know, I was looking at this week, and I guess I can relate to that. I feel a lot the same way. Lord, if you just show me. And you know, and he's so gracious at times to show up, and, and, and he does show us at times. And, he, and, he, and, he, and he'll give a word. Or, or you, you know, you, you can go into it with confidence and just know that God, God was really leading, and, and, and some kind of evidence comes out. Anybody ever had some evidence happen in your life? Come on, be honest. Let's testify to that. In fact, let's give the Lord praise for that. When he, when he, when he really does that. that, that's a good thing. When you just know. But I, but I was looking at this, 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 this faith issue goes pretty deep. 
He's not sure that Jesus even exists. But, but I look at, and I bring that up to our day and, and, and the kind of faith crisis we have. And, and, I, and I think about the times that Jesus dealt with that. And I have to ask ourselves the question, how much more evidence do we need? How much more evidence do we need? I mean, Romans, he tells us that even the person that's never been told ought to have a measure of faith just because he looks out at creation and sees what God has done. I mean, when's the last time you kind of opened your eyes and really, man, there is a creator, there is a designer, there is an architect, there is an engineer that tops all engineers, there is an architect that tops all architects, there is a creator that tops all creators. I mean, it's everywhere around us. There is a mighty God just in creation. Well, just starting there is something. You process and you begin to look at his word. How many times is his word, as you've read it, know it, been taught, somehow things come through as it says he would do? How often have you looked back at your story and when you were in the middle of a mess, you couldn't figure it out. You didn't know what the next step should be. You didn't know how to handle something. And somehow today, when you look back, you can say, oh my goodness, that had to be the hand of God because that was all smarter than me. I was upset. I was worried. I was frustrated. I didn't know how it was all going to work out. And you think it happened by happenstance? God showed up and took care of that thing? How many can say the Lord has done that for me? How much evidence do we need? The older we get, we ought to have evidence heaped up on top of evidence and ev layers of evidence, layers and layers and layers of evidence of how good God's been to us. Am I right? David told us to remember, to look back, to remember, transform lives. I mean, my goodness. You watch a guy comes in, come in last week and know the power of salvation I've watched people, I'm not meaning to be cute when I say this, but I've watched people go from the bondage of booze to the Bible, from this terrible stink of sin to a transformed life and salvation when they had tried counseling, nothing wrong with counseling, but that in of itself won't save you. They had tried talking to pastors, that in itself won't save you. But when they got a hold of Jesus and Jesus got a hold of them, something amazing took place and their lives completely turned around. You explain that. And such were some of you. That's who we are today. Day. We can give the Lord praise for that. That's all right. Transform lives. An unwavering need for evidence. Among us this day, we have many people who are like Thomas, dubious, and demanding signs and tokens, suspicious, oftentimes sad. And I'm not sure there's not a slight touch of Thomas, but what there's not a slight touch of Thomas in most of us. There are times and seasons when the strong man fails. Disappointment sets in. It's not, not all turning our way. And we develop perceptions. And we find ourselves in the middle of a faith crisis. Secondly, notice the faith characteristics. And this will be the last point, the faith characteristics. In verses 26 to 29, Jesus let Thomas for a while taste the bitterness of his, of his doubts. And people are often permitted to drink deeply of, of this bitter cup. Jesus, Jesus let him taste it for eight days. But Jesus was full of forbearance toward him, full of grace by providing his unbelievable presence. His presence. Our Lord's appearance and his presence are, are not limited by the walls we find ourselves in. Thomas, eight days later, finds himself back together with the disciples. No doubt they're trying to convince him, Thomas, we're, we're not joking. We're not playing games with you, sir. We've seen Jesus. We've talked to him. We're not kidding. I'm not believing unless I experience him myself. But Thomas, he's with us. There's this gathering. They're inside the four walls. And suddenly, Jesus appears without ever opening a door. You see, Jesus is not limited by your walls you have up. You didn't get that. 
Jesus is not limited by your walls. <laughs> he, he has a presence that will permeate and work through your unbelief. It will work through all of your intellect. It will work through all of your intellectual uh, approaches. To uh, There's nothing wrong with being a thinking Christian. We have to be a thinking Christian. But I'm telling you, at some point or another, it's going to be reduced to faith. Faith. I said faith. You've got to choose to believe. And something happens when faith connects with the Creator. I can't explain it all. I feel like the blind man. I once was blind. I can't explain it. I can't explain it to the Pharisees that come. I can't always explain it to the religious community. But this one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. It's faith. It's not ignorance. There's a difference between ignorance and faith. When you got faith, you know you've got faith. Let's give the Lord praise for faith today. Faith that says he is. His presence has the ability to step into all of these walls that that we create. He appears regardless of how Thomas feels. Thomas may not feel so good right now. He's rather negative. He's cynical. He's pessimistic. I can understand that. Those words aren't meant to cut on Thomas. I can understand that, can't you? But every barrier, every wall, Jesus chooses to step through it. Neither is his presence limited by your perceptions and doubts. His presence is not limited by your protective walls. Why believe again? It didn't work out the last time. Why should I believe? It didn't work out the last time. I tell you, I've, I've told this story before, and I don't, I don't want to wear it out, but it's, I've got to bring who I am to the pulpit. And I'll not belabor it, because many of you heard it. But when my mother died at age 51, one week into her 51st birthday... I went so far to fly Shadrach Namtabella from South Africa, who was over Maranatha Ministries, who had literally seen people raised from the dead. It was documented. We saw the paperwork from it. He had over 100,000 followers. He's the cousin of Chief Budalesi in those days. And if you don't have any history there from way back, Shadrach Namtabella, I'll never forget, I flew him in. I flew him in to lay hands on my mother to pray the prayer of faith because I became convinced that I had prayed and fasted and called out on God and nothing was changing. I flew him to Denver. I drove him all the way to Cleveland, Tennessee where my mother laid in a hospital down in Chattanooga. And we prayed and nothing happened. I stood on the word. We put words in her ear. We did everything, but it didn't happen. And I'm telling you, as a pastor in a growing church at that time, I developed a faith crisis. I developed a faith crisis. You can step back and analyze this and that, and you didn't do this, and you didn't do that, and you didn't believe this, and you didn't believe, believe that. Hogwash. That's a Kentucky word. Nonsense. I don't understand it all. I just know that God's sovereign and he's in control. Because I don't understand how six months later I could be in Ogden, Utah. I had no faith. But somehow a woman who's a stroke victim with her side of her face hanging down, when hands were laid on her, suddenly that face straightened up and she was divinely healed. I don't understand all of that. I don't know why he didn't touch my mother and he touched this woman. All I know is God is still on the throne and he's in control of all. I know that to be true. That's all I know. So I don't know how you're going to work out your faith crisis. I know that he had to help me. He had to help me. And somehow when I was at my lowest point, even questioning, am I preaching a gospel that doesn't work as a 28-year-old young pastor? Jesus stepped in a meeting of about 20 people in Ogden, Utah, right in the middle of Mormon country, and healed a woman. And under Rocky Srabel, who was my brother-in-law, that church went from nothing to 250. And that miracle launched that church. The next night, the whole office building where she worked showed up for the meeting. Jesus can appear in the middle of your greatest doubt. Amen. 